Well, I'd like you to take your Bibles this afternoon and turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. In light of the theme of our conference, the question at hand as we conclude is, what, what should the church do? Well, obviously, that's a broad question. And it's very difficult to give an answer to that question because there's so many things the church is to do. So what I'd like to do is actually to go to the simplest and the most basic thing. In one sense, I don't think we need to really talk or tell each other what to do because in many ways we know. However, living in the light of our times, we must continue to reiterate and repeat the most basic, fundamental, and hope-filled truths to those who are enslaved in destructive behaviors, to teach them that God's word works, it really does, that we must proclaim the transformational truths that are found in the gospel of Jesus Christ so that those who are captives can be delivered and those who are oppressed can be liberated. And so this afternoon, I'd like us to look at Paul's letter in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2, as we will look very carefully this afternoon at what Paul tells us to do. Notice he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Repute, reprove, rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The Apostle Paul here is writing within weeks, perhaps even days of his martyrdom. According to historical tradition, Paul was beheaded on the Ostian way. And for 30 years, the Apostle Paul labored as an apostle, as an itinerant evangelist. And he says it himself, he's fought a good fight. He has finished the race. He's kept the faith. And soon he would receive the reward, the crown of righteousness that he was assured that had been laid up for him in heaven. So, what is Paul going to leave behind for us? You could ask the question, what is his legacy? And clearly, he's left behind the inspired word of God for us today. And specifically, we have here 2 Timothy. And as we read this letter, we find ourselves immersed in a very solemn atmosphere. It is a man who is about to leave this earth. And so in three occasions, he charges Timothy. He urges him. It is impossible to read these words without being profoundly stirred. And specifically, he is giving charge to Timothy as to what he and the church are to do. And practically, what Paul says applies to every one of us sitting here today. What should the church do? And in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul gives a series of five commands, with the first command being the lead or the primary command, and the other commands are simply amp amplifications of what the one first command is to do. And what are we to do according to verse 2? He says we are to preach the word. What is the church to do today? What is our calling today? We are to preach the word. There is nothing so foundational, so basic, and so important to the church as preaching the word. Preaching is core. Preaching is missional. Preaching is transformational. When I came to Bob Jones University to be the president six years ago, I knew that there would be something that would be core to the mission of this school that would make it distinct from almost all other universities. Because we are actually more than a university. We are a Christian university. 
We are Bible believers. And at the very core of our mission is the word of God. And the most important thing we can do is to preach the word. And so this afternoon, I'd like us to look at that command and as Paul amplifies it. And I'd like to ask two very simple questions as we seek to look at it more carefully in detail. As the command is given, the first thing I want us to ask is, what then is the word that we are to preach? And the verses here in chapter four and two, chapter four, verses one and two are preceded by chapter three, verses 16 and 17. And here the apostle Paul presents the most lucid statement in the entire Bible concerning the nature of the benefit and the effect of the word that we are to preach. Notice chapter three, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So what is the word that we are to preach? We, the word we are to preach is the inspired word of God. The term Paul uses, inspiration or given of inspiration, describes the nature of the Bible, the book that you hold in your hand. And that is that this is God breathed. That's the Greek word theopneustos. And just like you cannot talk without breathing out, so Paul is saying that the scriptures themselves are God's breathed out words recorded for us. And of course, the focus here is primarily on the words themselves. So what is the Bible doing here? It is self-authenticating its own origin. It is announcing, I am divine. And by so making this declaration of divine inspiration, the scripture is claiming to be telling the truth about God because it is from God. And consequently, if it is not God breathed, then it cannot be true. And the Bible becomes the greatest book of lies, lies ever perpetrated on the world. That book you hold in your hand is either truth or it's error. And decide that you believe that the Bible is God breathed. It is his very words. Jesus said, thy word is truth. So what are we to do? We are to preach the truth. Not man's words, but God's words. Not man's ideas or thoughts, but God's ideas and thoughts. Not man's wisdom, but God's wisdom. Preach the word. And notice that this command to preach includes all of God's words. Inspiration extends to the entire sacred text. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I believe in the inspiration of the Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. So notice carefully, Paul is not saying all God-breathed scripture is profitable, leaving a question as to which scripture is God-breathed. But rather, he is stating emphatically that all scripture, both Old and New Testament, is God-breathed. And therefore, we are to preach all of the word of God. One biographer of John Calvin commented on the content of his preaching. It says, it said that on Sunday, he always took the New Testament, except for a few Psalms on Sunday afternoon. And during the week, it was always the Old Testament. He took five years to complete the book of Acts. He preached 46 sermons on Thessalonians, 108 
86 sermons on Corinthians, 86 on the pastoral epistles, 43 sermons on Galatians, 48 sermons on Ephesians. He spent five years on his harmony of the gospels. This was just his Sunday work. And during the weekdays in those five years, he preached 159 sermons on Job, 200 on Deuteronomy, 353 on Isaiah, and 123 on the book of, of Genesis. He preached all of the word. By the way, preaching is hard work, amen? amen? It's not three points and a poem, take a text and throw a fit. It's preaching the Bible and believing that it is the inspired word of God. The word we preach is inspired. But he also says that the word we preach is profitable. The scripture the meaning here of the word profitable means it's beneficial. It has value. And in general, according to chapter 3 and verse 15, it says that the essential benefit of the word is it is to make us wise unto salvation. It is through the preaching of the scripture that we understand God's scheme, God's plan of salvation. The overarching purpose of the Bible is not to teach us subjects like science, Though what it says about science is accurate. But it is to teach us the revelation of God. You can't know God if God doesn't reveal himself to you because we can't think like God. We cannot comprehend God. We are in darkness and we need the light of scripture. And so the revelation of God's word teaches us God's plan of redemption. The whole Bible discloses God's scheme of salvation. And since salvation is through Jesus Christ, then the Bible focuses attention on the Son of God. The Old Testament foretells and foreshadows the coming of Christ with the intention of preparing the hearts of people to receive him. The Gospels tell us of his person and his work with the primary focus on his death and resurrection. The epistles unfold the glory of Christ's plan of salvation and how it applies to both the believer's faith and his spiritual maturity and growth. And the book of the Revelation reveals the end of the age with the coming return and the reign of Jesus Christ. So to preach the word is to preach Christ. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. In one way, you can't preach a bad sermon if you preach the truth. Now, I'm going to qualify that. My wife loves preaching. Every morning I get up to have my devotions my wife goes in the bathroom and every single morning she listens to a preacher. She told me, she said, Steve, it's hard for me to listen to a bad sermon because I've heard so many sermons in my lifetime, I only want to listen to good ones. But if you preach the truth, you're preaching a good sermon. Amen. Because that's what preaching is all about. It is profitable and specifically the Apostle Paul tells us the benefit or value of scripture is that it is the source of for what we believe and the way we should behave. And so Paul spells this out in four phrases, all beginning with the preposition for. The first two, for doctrine and for reproof. That is, it refers to both the positive and the negative elements of what we believe. It includes the teaching of truth for doctrine and the, re and the refutation of error for reproof. It shows us what we should and what we should not believe. And the value of scripture is that as we learn it, we become solid, whole, sound, and discerning people. People who know what is true and people who know what is false. That is the effect of sound preaching. And of course, Paul is concerned about this because later on in chapter 4, he says the day is going to come when people's ears will be turned away from the truth. 
They will be looking for teachers and preachers who tickle their ears, but not reach their heart. And so he is concerned that the right kind of preaching will be the kind of preaching that is clear and understood so that people's lives can be changed. A number of years ago, I was preaching overseas in the country of India. My interpreter was an older gentleman, was a great preacher. His name was T.T. Varghese. I just called him Brother T.T. He was so loud, he didn't, have, he, didn't need a, uh, uh, he didn't need a sound system. He had a built-in loudspeaker. And whenever he would tell my illustrations, instead of adjusting to my, vo my voice inflections, he just shouted at the top of his lungs. And one day we sat down, he said, he said, Steve, he said, I don't preach for every Tom, Dick, and Harry that comes to India. He said, a number of years ago, I was preaching in a tent crusade. I was interpreting for a gentleman. When I finished the interpretation, I sat down and I begged God to forgive me for what I said. And I got on the bus and I left. I said, Brother Titi, what did you preach? He said, I preached another Jesus. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I preached a Jesus that would help you and would heal you and would bless you and make your life happy and good. But he said, he never preached, a, as he said it, a crucified Savior. He said, because where you preach the cross, it makes people mad and there's persecution. And I'll never forget that statement because I, here I am in, in India, out of the United States of America. And you know, you sort of readjust your focus when you're, when you're away from where you're normally living. And he said, I only interpret for people who preach the cross. So the next meeting I preached and he interpreted. I preached on the woman with the issue of blood, how Jesus healed her, saved her. At the end of the sermon, he came up to me, he said, good sermon. Next time, more cross. <laughs> I come back to the United States. I'm in Denver, Colorado, where my wife grew up at my in-laws home. And the TV was on, and it was a church service out of Houston, Texas. And my mother-in-law was sitting there listening to this preacher preach. And I turned to her about five minutes into it. I said, do you know that he's a false teacher? She said, how do you know that? I said, listen to him. I said, listen to if he ever preaches the cross. He preached about a Jesus who will heal you and a Jesus will help you and a Jesus who will bless you. But he never preached on the fallen nature of man, the corruption of man and, and the necessity of a blood sacrificial atonement for the pay for his sins to deliver him from the judgment and the wrath of God. I said the right kind of preaching is profitable. Because it gives people discernment in a day of error. What are we to do? We are to preach the word. But notice he says there are two more words. He said the second two for correction and for instruction in righteousness. Here he is referring to the negative and the positive aspects of the kind of preaching that teaches us not only what we are to believe, but the way we are to behave. He is referring here to the reformation of our behavior and the discipline of our character in righteous living. What we should do and what we should not do. He gives us a correct perspective, for example, on what the conference is all about. How do we look at addictions in the, in the day in which we're living in? That's why I appreciate 
Dr. Street and what he said yesterday, he says he uses the word addictions because people understand it, but the real biblical word is bondage. Because addiction means you can't ever be free, but bondage means you can get delivered. We, pe we preach a hope-filled message that people are not victims, but they can be victorious. They can overcome. And the right kind of preaching teaches people how to actually experience that. Do you know Christian living does not work the way we normally or naturally think? If I could illustrate it this way. How many of you play the game of golf? Raise your hand. How many of you don't play the game of golf and could care less? Raise your hand. Okay, most of you. One of the first things you learn about golf, my dad taught me golf when I was a little boy and he taught me how to hold the club and how to swing the club. And what you learn in golf is that the way you play is not natural. In other words, you think that that little white ball sitting on the ground with that big old club, you can just whack it. And it'll just fly like the professionals. But if you don't learn how to grip it, and you don't learn how to swing it, you're probably not even going to hit it. You'll probably miss it the first time you'll swing. And if you do hit it, it probably won't go very far, or it'll go this way, or it'll go that way, but it's supposed to go that way. And learning to swing and hold a golf club is actually goes against the natural way that you think. Do you know the same is true in growth in holiness? Because we naturally think of what we are supposed to do in our behavior. But the first thing that we're to do is to understand not what we are to do, but to understand what Christ has done. Because Paul's writings in the New Testament, when he addresses behavior, always starts with beliefs. Before he gives an imperative, what I'm to do, he gives multiple indicatives as to what he has done. And the focus for overcoming sin is not primarily your self-will, but it is the work of Jesus on the cross. For Jesus died not just to deliver you from the penalty of sin, but the power of that sin in your own heart. And you have to learn that. And you learn that through sound preaching of the word. The word, is, the word is profitable. The word is inspired. This is the word we're to preach. And then notice thirdly, the word we are to preach is sufficient. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, this phrase could mean that the scripture is profitable for the spiritual maturity of the man of God. And that's, and that's a plausible way to look at it. So it's, it's a fine way to look at it. However, I believe that the primary meaning of the statement is that the word is sufficient, or it is perfect, he uses here. The word is sufficient for an effective ministry for the man of God. When he says the man of God may be perfect, it means adequate competent, capable, proficient, able to meet the demands for the ministry. In other words, the preaching of the word, the teaching of the word is sufficient in order to have an effective ministry. The word of God works. And if people will come to understand that and see that they will never be satisfied with shallow preaching, ever. It's hard to like hot dogs after you've eaten filet mignon. And the preaching of the word is sufficient for an effective ministry, not pop psychology, not the latest cultural fads, not rhetoric, not politics, not the latest wind blowing by, but it is the all-sufficient word that is effective in the ministry. The word is perfect 
And the word equips us for all good works. All the tools needed for an effective ministry is found in the word. Last week I was in California and had the opportunity to spend about 45 minutes with John MacArthur. And he told me something I didn't know. He said he, when he was a student here at Bob Jones University in circa 1957, his freshman year, his first semester, he took five hours of Greek and second semester he took five hours of Greek. And his sophomore year, he took three hours of Greek the next semester and three hours Greek. He said he had a total of 16 hours of Greek. He said it was grueling. That should encourage most of you. He said, I was a young 18 year old, not really knowing what I should do, trying to figure out things. But he said, I learned Greek. And then when I finished my degree, I had more. He said, I ended up with some 24 hours or so of, of Greek. And then he looked at me, he said, those 16 hours of Greek where I learned the Greek language so that I could study the Greek New Testament was the foundation for my 50 years of preaching here at this church. I thought that means something. Everybody should go to Bob Jones University. <laughs> the word of God is sufficient for an effective ministry. There is no substitute for learning the word. The best counselor is the best theologian. So what must the church do? We must fully and unequivocally embrace the absolute sufficiency of the scripture for the, for the saving and the restoration of man's soul. Preach the word. But then secondly, not only what is this word that we're to preach, but the second thing is what is the kind of preaching that we are to do? And in verse 2, Paul sets forth five commands, all explaining to us the kind of preaching we are to do. And the first, which is foundational, is the primary command. And the other four uh, amplify the very first command. So what is the command? What are we to do? We are to preach. So what does it mean to preach? The word is the idea of, of someone who in ancient times would go back out in the marketplace before they had newspapers or internet or before they had Twitter or, or Fox News. And they would go out into the marketplace and they would loudly proclaim, they would loudly announce the news. And in many cases, it could be a message from the king and their responsibility was to lift up their voice loudly. And they were to make the truth known. They were not to be man-fearers and they were not to be man-pleasers. Because the tone of their voice is one of declaration and authority for they are speaking on the behalf of the king. So proclaim it aloud. That's what it means. Preach. Preach it boldly. Manly. That's why I believe preachers are supposed to be men. Manly. Straightforward. Preaching is teaching from a point of authority with the intention to persuade. A friend of mine viewed his preaching this way. He said, when I preach, I, I feel like I'm, I'm in a courtroom and the devil is on the stand. God is the judge. The audience is the jury. I'm the prosecuting attorney and I'm trying to get a guilty verdict on the devil every time. 
And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with the excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The power of the gospel is not preaching it in a unique way, but it is preaching it as it is for men as they are. Preaching is declaration. A number of years ago, I urged my mother. She was living down in Columbia, South Carolina, where I grew, grew up, and I, she had actually just moved back there, and I went down. I said, Mama, you got to go to church. I said, Mama, you got to get in church. She said to me in her own way, well, I am not going to be a Baptist. I said, Mama, you don't have to be a Baptist. I want you to be a Christian, and I want you to be in church. So I said, I'm going to take you to church this Sunday. Well, my mother grew up as a Methodist. My grandfather grew up as a Presbyterian. I grew up as a Presbyterian until I was converted, and I'm not making any statement on that. But, but, uh, but I grew up in a very liberal church, but it was Presbyterian. So I took my mother to downtown Columbia, First Presbyterian Church. And the pastor's name was Sinclair Ferguson. She began to attend church regularly because of the preaching of the Bible. And my mother said the first thing that she noticed about the preaching was the nature of his preaching. That he actually preached the Bible. It was expositional. She didn't even know what that meant. And one day I went with her to church and afterwards she looked at me. She said, why, that man preaches like a Baptist. And she said, he'll make you want to believe. I said, yeah. We're to preach with authority. All power is given unto us in heaven and earth. We're to preach as an ambassador. We are ambassadors for Christ. And we are begging you in Christ's stead. Literally, I'm standing in the place of Jesus Christ. That's what the preacher's doing. When Paul said to the church of Ephesus, he said, you didn't learn Christ this way. He used a term that actually as he preached, they were learning as if Christ was the one who was there. What a glorious thing to be a preacher of the scriptures because you're standing as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So we should hurl the word at people. Ian Murray wrote in his book on Jonathan Edwards in his new biography. He said the commonly accepted preaching prior to the great awakening of the 1740s was not calculated to break through the prevailing formalism and indifference among the hearers. Preaching that brought men to a sense of need and humiliation before God was of a very different order. The greatest practical lesson from the 1735 revival for the pulpits of our day is that when ministers have to deal with indifference and unconcern, they will simply beat the air unless they begin where the Holy Spirit begins. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We are to preach the word. And then he amplifies it. He says, first of all, be urgent, be instant, in season, out of season. The word instant means to be ready to go. You never lose your sense of urgency. You're on the edge of your seat. The solemn charge of verse 1 should produce urgency in the one who preaches. We have the ever-watching eye of the Father and the Son and the all-inspiring reminder of our coming judgment that God will hold us accountable for the very things we've said. Be urgent. In season. Out of season. This refers to times or seasons, whether it's a good time or not a good time. At Bob Jones, we have chapel four days a week. Some days are better to preach than other days. Sometimes the students are a little more open than they are at other times. And there's always the tendency to want to adjust the message 
to the ear of the hearer. That's a dangerous thing. Because for a ready-made preacher, all times are good times as long as the preacher is ready. Be instant. The preacher does not get his motivation from the crowd. He gets his motivation from the power of the truth working in him through the power of the Spirit. Preaching is the overflow of the spiritual life of the preacher. His motivation comes because the times are evil and life is brief and eternity is coming and men and women are here today and gone tomorrow. We are standing between the living and the dead. Be instant, in season, out of season. And the command to be urgent is particularly necessary because Paul says the time is coming when people will not be interested. I think we're living in those days today. When I started in the ministry, we had church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. At least three sermons a week. I'm not saying that we have to go back to the way it was 40 years ago, but I am saying I don't think we're a lot more spiritual today than we were 40 years ago. And so the necessity of getting the word inside of you is of such a nature that one sermon is not sufficient. We need it daily. We need it continually. So be urgent in season and out of season. And then notice the last three commands. Or maybe if I could suggest three different ways of doing it. He said reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. God speaks to different people in different situations. The preacher must be skillful in the use of the word. He says, reprove. That's the idea of argumentation, arguing with the truth and, and working through people's minds. That's intellectual. He says, rebuke. That is reproving somebody. That's moral correction. And then he says, exhort. That's appealing. That's more emotional. Some people are tormented by doubts and they need to be convinced by solid arguments. Some people have fallen into sin and they need to be rebuked for their sin. Some people are haunted by fears and they need to be encouraged. In every case, we are to apply the word relevantly to the individual at their situation and where they're living. One preacher said it this way. He said, when I preach, he said, I want to inform your mind. I want to warm your heart. I want to stir your will. And I want to tan your hide. Preach the word. But it's to be done with all long suffering and doctrine. It appears that the most effective pulpit ministry is the long term, consistent, systematic exposition of God's word with all patience, long suffering and doctrine. This seems to be in the ministries that I've been involved with now for some 45 years that the most effective long-term ministries are not the flashy, it's not the, the, the churches that explode but it is that consistent, sound, solid godliness of the pastor in the preaching of the word and giving the people the word of God and building their lives step by step, brick by brick. And as I look around in the world today and what God is doing in the world, he's raising up generations of preachers from countries all over the world, not just the United States who take this command of what the church is to do, to preach the word. And they've given themselves unreservedly for that kind of a ministry. What are we today, what should the church do? The church should preach the word. 